Ladies and gentlemen, large hordes of folks. <laughs> My name is Master Farron. Um, I'm a storyteller and researcher here in Ontario. And I kept encountering sort of myths, really barriers between uh, the Laurel Council and the more general audience that we serve, the citizens of Ontario. And a lot of these just had to do with someone told someone something and the phone game happened. And that myth got bigger and bigger. And it really turned into people stopping to talk with laurels, stopping, to, stopping engaging in that process. And it helped build this barrier between the citizenry and the Laurel Council. And because of that, I started having this thought of how can we do this outreach? How can we get more interaction? How can we dispel these myths? And as part of one of those prongs and that process, I started these Laurel panels. And we choose a subject, and we try to delve in depth with people who are experts in that area, and allow you guys to have a sort of Q&A, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation with them. So we're going to start it off by having a conversation here, and my role in this as moderator um, as Laurels, we like to write a lot, we like to talk a lot about our thing, and all of a sudden we're over there. <laughs> and my job is to reel them in. So I have expressed permission from these two particular Laurels to tell them when to shut up. <laughs> um, at the end, we'll have questions and comments or near the middle and more of a conversation with the audience. Um, I want to just give two or three minutes for each of our Laurels to go first. Alessandra starts with A. So we'll Hi, I'm Alessandra. Um, my interest is in bardic research studies. I love to study, um, my, I play a variety of mostly strained bowed instruments, so things that were early violins, Rebecca's lira de braccio, I do play mandolin, um, nickel harpa, um, lots of strange things, I do percussion, and I do lots of research about that. I did a lot of research on English country dances and how those things are done, and also Sephardic music, which is actually something she and I kind of have a thing with, and uh, so I love to do Sephardic music as well. Um, I love to, the thing I love to do mostly as a Laurel, um, and, and I grew up in the SCA doing court music mostly, so playing for courts is what I do, do because unlike my husband, I don't like to be in the center, and unlike Farron, I'm not a big center stage person. I'm more like the ambiance on the side, playing quiet music in the background to sort of help your, set your ambience. Um, as a Laurel, my favorite thing is to have students and to teach them and help sponsor them and help them. My joy is to help other people hone their skills in the SCA. So that's really what I like to do is find people, teach people, um, bring them to the attention of other people, um, and help them find their walk. <laughs> now, I want your full name. Just going Mistress out Alessandra Nifeli Mokdalgish. Wonderful. <laughs> now you can start with your full name. Oh, there you uh -huh. go. This my first name sounds like first and, and last. <laughs> Um, I'm Mr. S. Dame, whatever, uh, Grandukht Mamigonian, uh, 11th century Armenian. In real life, I'm also Armenian, so I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm mostly into uh, Armenian bardic and also textiles. I do dyes, knitting, um, but I, I think Armenian bardic is like my main thing. Be so uh, I also like to take students and, and since I think whether you're a Laurel or not, the whole point is that some of, the, some of these arts are almost dead. And so the whole point is to keep it alive by passing it on. And so I like to do that as well. That's it. <laughs> Wonderful. Dance. Dance, dance yes, dance. I do dance. I do Armenian dance. I do belly dancing and Armenian dancing. I've taught on both at 30 year and all everywhere else in between. Does someone have a sundial on their hand? Uh, I can check. Could you guys give me a heads up when we're getting closer to 12.30, which is where we're going to be ending up on this? Now, a they quarter to 12 now. It's a quarter to 12 now. OK. Could you give me at 12.30 and then 12.45? Um, really, uh, OK. So this started off very curated. I picked two wonderful, amazing laurels. And unfortunately, they happen to be pelicans. I chose another set of florals, and it so happened they happened to be pelicans. Guess when the pelican meeting is? Right now. Um, <laughs> and it just so happened that these two friends of mine became available. And, and are not pelicans. And are not pelicans. <laughs> yes. Um, but it all so happens that they have a passion for teaching and students. 
And it's really great that, yeah, uh, of course, the title of this meeting is um, The Laurelet, A Peak of Their Process. Uh, so what we're going to do is cover the process of the Lower Council. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about how we discuss candidates, how we choose students, um, how do we find those people who are doing their cool thing, look at them, and integrate them into the bureaucracy that is the Laurel Council. Um, I'd love to start off with Alessandra. Um, you have a passion for students, uh, lots of students, and you have made your students swear that they can't become Baron and Baroness so that they can get through the process. I remember well because I was one of your students. And I wanted to just have you touch on um, a, a, a few ways that people do the student process. There's a lot of these myths about, I have to have this formal contract and it, it lasts a year and you know all of these, this is the thing. And, and it's my impression that it can actually be a wider variety of things. And I'd love for you to, to draw that part. Sure. Um, so when I first started uh, looking for laurels anyway, I found different laurels. Some people have those very strict contracts and they do things like make them set up their tents and carry them food. And it's a very much a sort of a medieval fetch and carry kind of role where hopefully you'll learn things from them as well. There's other people who have a very informal thing. Most people, for me, you have the right to camp with me and participate. Of course, I also host the Kingdom Bardic Circle um, and we ho host an open Bardic event every um, May Crown, July Coronation, and September Crown where anybody in the whole kingdom is welcome to camp with us and we do Bardic Circles and we do classes and things like that. Um, but I expect my apprentices, they're welcome to come camp with us or not. Um, there are lots of people, some of the relationships are very structured. What I found is um, I have been less successful, but other people are more successful with apprentices that they take on where you want to teach your craft. My craft is so specialized, there's very few people dying to know how to play the nickel harpa. But there's lots of people who want to be musicians or who want to be storytellers or who, who want to do things in the bardic arts or learn how to research. So I take more, um, I tend to find students for myself, I'm most successful with people who their craft, they have well in hand. They know how to play their instrument. They know how to do the thing. Maybe they want help learning how to research or they want to know how to present their information or how can they be brought up into the attention of people who, who if, because they have a goal and purpose. Um, but that actually speaks to another type. There are, you'll find different laurels. Some laurels are like, it's not okay to say you want to be a laurel. You, you need to, you can, you have to say I want to learn my craft or my this or my that. I'm not one of those laurels. I think it's perfectly fine to, to yearn for a goal and to say this is something I, I, I want to aspire to. It doesn't mean I want to be giving it freely, cheaply, you know, for not having earned it, I'm, but I think it's okay to aspire to something. I think it's admirable, and for me, it focuses me and it hones my craft. So it goes, oh, from something that I sort of dithered around in in my 20s to, oh, right, let me actually get good at that because I have a goal, something I'm aspiring to, and so that works well for me. So it works well for me to have apprentices that are like that as well. And so... I wanted to actually jump back on that point there. Um, the. the You've taken a lot of apprentices who aren't directly your craft. Right. I'd love to hear your experience of taking, do you take only apprentices on who do your thing? No. Or have you cross-wonked? Because no, I hear I'm, that myth a lot. I've got to know, yeah, you yeah, know, I've got to, yeah. I've, I have to find the Laurel who does my Not thing. One. It, no, I actually, currently I have an apprentice who's Irish. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a way they're related to us Armenians, but uh, <laughs> um, by love, we're related to everybody. But uh, not necessarily, because with Messina, what she wanted to focus on is uh, how to, to be better at what she's interested in. And also the machinery of things like how do you enter contests or championships and, or do even like the, the displays. Or do you, you have to? Yeah. Right. Or can I do it in another way? Right, exactly. And so it's, it's more of that. So uh, let me see, I think. I had Shadra was my second uh, hmm. student. She was close. She's done Persian stuff, and so it's like closer to my thing. But Shadra could have done it on her own to reach the what she did really to get the Laurel thing. But with her, it was more again someone who was sort of guide her a little more, you know. So, but not her craft. No. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Certainly not Armenian Bardic. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that uh, people do is. Um, they'll take on students and not apprentices. So a lot of times people will say, let's just try having a student-teacher relationship for a while and see how that goes. Um, it's great for the little because they can set out an expectation. Hey, why don't you go memorize 10 country English country songs to play for court, you know, and set out and see if you do those things. And you can see if you find 
what the Laurel asked you to do aspirational and motivating. You know, you can kind of, so a lot of times you just start with something informal too, and then see how that goes. Which really jumps into like, how, how do you become a student? How do you take on a student? Um, there's a, a lot of these questions that I've had at these meetings are like, how do I ask a Laurel? How do I enter that process? And, and I hear this dichotomy of like, is there a formal request form that I submit to a Laurel? And I'd like to hear more about your experiences of how you engaged that process. I um, actually, for a while, I was doing just, excuse my expression, but it's the only one that works really, half-assed job. And then I decided it's time to do better than that because it's not fair to me and it's also not fair to others because the whole purpose for me to be in the SEA and to be Armenian is because a lot of people have never heard of the Armenians. And so it's up to me to show people the different aspects of our culture. And so I better do it right. And so I decided, okay, it's, it's time to look for someone to be my coach, to sort of guide me. I mean, obviously I get to do all the research on Armenian stuff, so there's nobody else who was being Armenian, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm it. So I took a year to ask Laurels, you know, what's it like, what's your method and all. And I also asked their apprentice or students or whatever, what is their teaching method like? Um, what else, what do they expect from you? What do you expect from them? Just sort of to a research to just for you. It's like, do I ask or do they ask? You know, and it, there isn't uh, an actual base, you know, formal rule about that. It, it somehow it just works where uh, sometimes you're asking the Laurel if you could be their apprentice. Sometimes it's the other way around. My first time it was, um, I think almost mutual because somebody else introduced me to her, but she was busy uh, in the mundane world. So we had this un stepping down kind of unapprentice <laughs> ceremony to show to people that, hey, she's no longer my Laurel, not because we fought or anything, but we were uh, reaching a point where that's not gonna work. And then as soon as that was established, somebody else approached me and she asked me to be her apprentice. So it went the other two hmm. different ways. The first time it was, I think, me asking her if I could be apprentice, and that second time it was her asking me. Yeah. Um, I, too, when I decided I wanted to find a Laurel, so part of it's why do you need a Laurel, and, and a main thing I think of is that a Laurel can be an advocate for you on the Laurel Council, especially in a kingdom this large. There's, there's so many, 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 many people, and so having somebody who personally is invested in what you're doing and what you're trying to do and what you're interested in and can be an advocate and a spokesperson and say, hey, did you know Dana's doing this really cool thing? You know, and you can talk about it and, and be, you know, and, and you can kind of share with the wins of this person. But what I did when I decided I wanted is I also went around and talked to Laurels and how did they, how did they take apprentices? How did they choose? How do they like to work? Um, and really had that. For me, what was important was somebody with whom I could be direct because I'm a very direct person. <laughs> so I wanted to be able to say, this is what I want to do, this is, that sucks, what do you mean? And I also needed somebody who could tell me, just do this because that's what we want. And because I don't like the whole, I don't like the mystery signs, right? <laughs> of, mm, have you thought about this? Just tell me what it is you want me to do so I can do it. And I'm very goal oriented that way. So I needed somebody who could handle that. <laughs> And, and do that in a, in a diplomatic way. So, yeah. And I think the segue is uh, really nice. So, you know, you sit there, you, you go out and you ask and you, you find out who these people are and you sort of create this relationship. Because uh, being a student, being an apprentice particularly, is not just, oh, you know, you're in this classroom doing this thing. And I'd love, love you guys to talk about sort of the, the seriousness, both of student and, and the more seriousness of apprenticeship and, and the relationship that you create there. Oh, me? Yeah. You're next. Well, you know, it has, sometimes the, the reason why, at least with me, I take a year with this person before we formalize anything, was is more to see if our personalities are going to work, if being either from the same geographical town or in an totally different state or even a country, if it's Canada, hmm. how that works, to, you know, how, if this person is someone I need to see more often or less often, you know, because sometimes ge geographic stuff has to be thought of. And, you know, you may, like some of these people I've, I've known in a social sort of way, not as a teacher and student or teacher and apprentice 
way and that really does change the relationship and how you interact with each other and stuff so that for me was the important part of giving it a year because it, it takes time to sort of percolate I guess that's the right <laughs> word <laughs> yeah and at the end of it you decide if, if if it's, if it's going to be something that both of you mutually agree you want to do, then you formalize it. In fact, I was going to be Mariam's, we were going to formalize uh, the thing. I was going to be the jour journeyman at Twelfth Night, but I was offered the Laurel thing, the two months <laughs> Laurel thing. <laughs> <laughs> the Laurel <laughs> two months before, so the Twelfth Night ended up being and actually becoming a Laurel instead of the journeyman for, for Mariam. You never know. I mean, I had no idea, you know, that's the other thing about uh, being the guide or the coach of the person because a lot of times we are our worst enemies and we think we're way more behind than we actually are and you, if this person deserves it, it's your job to kind of encourage them and, and help them with that self-esteem. So, uh, Part of why I learned I do really well with people who mostly have their skills mostly done and maybe just need a little coaching is is because the ones that I've taken on that haven't been that way haven't worked out well. Like there's a couple of people who not once but twice had I had people who came to me and said they wanted to be my apprentice and they had skills they need to learn and things they needed to do. And then they stepped up to be Baroness. Twice. Two different people. I had another person step up and join and say he wanted to do it and then he went off and joined a mundane band and I never mm -hmm. saw or heard from him for like five years. Um, yeah, and then there's people who knew people who say, yes, I want to do this, and I'll say, great, well, okay, I need you to work on this. Like, you need to learn this body of work, and I want you to memorize it, and it needs to be up to this tempo, and they just never quite have the motivation to do it. A million reasons why they don't, even though it's what they want to do. And so when that happens, I get uh, frustrated. Um, but the ones that have their skills done, they're kind of the fun ones. Yeah. Why does stepping up should be a because it sucks all of their time away. Mm. So what I end yeah. up doing now is when I start talking to people about taking apprentice, I make them swear that they will not step up to be baroness. Boy or girl, they have to make that promise I to I can me. now be a baroness. Hold on. Right. <laughs> a lot of money. No, it takes a lot of their time away. I mean, when somebody steps up to that kind of responsibility in the society, their, time, their life is gone for the entire time period they're that way. And often when they step down, you'll find that they have other interests by then. They've decided that they're more doing service things or other other things that they're really interested in. At least that's what has happened to the two people who did that. <laughs> right? And so it's not that it's a bad thing. I think service is wonderful in the society, but we have a lot of paths we can choose to walk. And arts is one side, service is another. And they're all great. It's just that um, you don't want to take on too many responsibilities. And to, to speak a little bit to that, um, you know, it's a process. Um, and when you're at the, I want to be this person's apprentice, that's the thing you're doing in the society. And a lot of my things sort of went to the wayside other than my craft, my research, and my relationship with my Laurel. And that, that was about three years of my SCA world where I did those things. And uh, as I, you know, came up and I, I got Laureled, I started bringing more of the other activities that I'd sort of let to the white side come on. And so it's, it's really that I'm sitting there, I have this dedication, I'm ready now, let's do this, um, is there. And there's... So can I, let me say something. So what I think is, when I started doing my art, I was like, hey, I had done my art as a kid, I hadn't done it for a long time, I think I'm going to start doing it. It's a great thing for the SCA to do in the SCA. Started doing that, that was fun, very interesting. Um, and then I would get better and better at it. And I really didn't necessarily need a laurel or want a laurel. I found places to do my craft, right? Like, I'm going to play court music. I'm going to play at Bardic Circles. I'm going to join this competition. Not everybody has to do competition. Oh, but there's this great feast. Hey, it's 30th year. Let's do some classes. And you just sort of organically do your arts, your science, whatever it is that is your passion. And that's great. And then, usually, in the processes of a person doing all of these things in this cycle, you have this thing where you go from learning your craft, honing your craft, becoming well-known, building that reputation, and then if there's a thing of, yes, but I also, because a Laurel isn't just an expert at it. They're, you're also, usually we're looking for Laurels to not just make pretty things or do pretty things, but also be really great at research and also have service in some way. Is it that you're sharing your craft? Are you teaching? Are you sharing those skills? Are you adding new knowledge 
to the kingdom, to the society in some sort of way. And so when you start to have that passion, and that's, oh, that's what I want, it's that last two or three years that start to get really intense. And that's where it's best to have a Laurel handing, helping you, right? When you're, it's like, so it's not, you know, there's just do your thing, and doing your thing is wonderful, and adding to the ambiance, and adding to the things you love to do. But at a certain point, if you're like, yeah, but you know what, I'd really love to be able to be that person that everybody sees as the go-to person. I'd love to have the opportunity to teach classes. I'd love to take formal students. To me, it got to be a real burden of, I'd really like to take formal students, and I can take students, but I can't take apprentices, unless I'm a Laurel, right? It became almost like, but, you know, that's different for everybody. Other people don't have that, that kind of desire. But for me, I wanted that legitimacy. I wanted that ability to say, yeah, I can take apprentices. And I can, I can teach classes. And I can do these things and be seen in that authority and do my thing in a different level. And so that was kind of a nice thing for me. But that last two or three years, you have to sort of hone down and focus. And that's where you then have to think about, for example, uh, I remember Leith getting to some point where we had to say, he would never, like, don't ever perform badly in public. <laughs> like, don't perform, like, when you're five years in, sure, you can sit there and play crappy stuff at Bardic Five because you're lur working on it, you know, it's not quite ready yet. <laughs> but then there's a certain point in those last two or three years, you don't want to be that perception of not ready, not, not prepared, right? So you want everything you do to be polished and sound good and be well researched. And with that, so uh, due to time, what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the council uh, yeah. regional councils and kingdom councils, and then we're going to open up the floor to questions from the audience. Um, so I know you moved out of Ontario, but you certainly have a lot of regional councils. I'd love to, to hit, well, what does a regional council look like, um, and which council were you in? Western is the regional I belong to. Um, it's, it's like the, the kingdom, but the mini version of it, but it's, the, <laughs> it's sort of like having a, a sieve. You know, if you're, you're shaking it so that the big bits are staying and the smaller bits are the ones that are going and that's the stuff that you're sort of, I don't know if I'm expressing this right, but you're, the regional is more about kind of sifting out the more sift, polished. Yeah, sifting yeah. out, that's right, that's the word. I wasn't born in this country, so the English sometimes is hard <laughs> to write to this. So yeah, exactly what he said. It's just that's what it, I think at least the regional meetings are about sifting out, and, because otherwise, if we talked about everybody, it would take more than a day. Yeah. Our list is off. We have like 300 people on the oh. Western list. So here's the thing, if you do arts and sciences in the kingdom, our job is to watch you be paranoid. <laughs> That's our job, mm -hmm. and, and by region. <laughs> so your regional rules are supposed to know who you are and what it is you're doing. That whether they do or not, it all depends because maybe you're doing something obscure. And if you don't do it in public, we might not know that you do it <laughs> if you only do it at home. But if you do things and you bring it out and you come to teas and you share what you're doing, theoretically you should be on a list somewhere. Um, Ontario is so big, we've broken it up into reporting regions. So you have Western, you have Turi, you have all these summits, all of these things, right? And then all of these different regions, we have lists. And generally, most of the regions, it's a little different nuanced in each region, but basically we have a list. Think of it as freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, right? So people who are brand new to their thing and it gets on that freshman list. We talk about them periodically. Western meets, meets very, very regularly. We meet like six or seven times a year. And we meet all the time and the main thing we do is we go through our candidate list we always like to talk to talk about the seniors and usually the juniors and we want about twice a year go through the sophomore and, and freshman list or we go through and is there anybody in that lower list list that has done something fantastic that we should talk about and maybe talk about moving them up and so that's where the advocacy comes in because they go oh yeah i saw fred over there and fred did this amazing thing we should move him from here to there when they start getting into that junior senior level, that's that two or three year time period where we're really seriously talking about somebody. When it's when in theory, what happens is as they move up that list and that senior, we talk about them a lot. We have a, a couple of different meetings, and at some point, we will then say, okay, they're ready to go to kingdom. They go to kingdom. Kingdom, you have two. Um, usually, traditionally, we try to have at least two kingdom meetings where we talk about that person, and somebody gives a presentation about them. Again, that advocacy there, right? It doesn't have to be their laurel. It could be somebody in the region who has cleverly, sneakily captured your things. <laughs> right. Lately, we've been trying with Bardic things to take recordings of it, um, do other things. His was the very first I brought my little tablet and 
she played played examples of his storytelling in the middle of the oral meeting. Here, look, you know, <laughs> and with a fake crackling fire and everything. So that's what we do: is that you have this kingdom meeting at least two talking about people, and people give their counsel to the king and queen about whether they think this person's prepared. They have an opportunity to ask questions. Maybe at that first one they might say, yeah, but what about their research? Or what about their this? Or what about their that? And then we have the second meeting to try to bring evidence about, yeah, we, this is, sorry, we didn't have that. The previous meeting, here's what we have this meeting. We have a conversation about this person's aptitudes and skills and what they've done and what they're bringing to the kingdom and why we think they're a good candidate. And if that happens, it's ultimately up to the king and queen to make a decision. Sorry, that's a very tactical answer. No, that, answer, was, and that's that was exactly the answer <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. looking for. Yeah. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd love to engage you guys in conversation. Do you have a question? Um, as a follow up that you just discussed, what happens um, when a person doesn't care for the area he lives in, but he has to live in there, and he does his art in another region? Is he not discussed? Um, it can be a problem, actually. Two of my apprentices um, are up in Thierry. One of them is, is, shh, is in Thierry, which is very north, and I live in western. And so what often you will, will find is, so, so that's the opposite. I live not in the region they live in. So let me think of another thing. Yes, sometimes it can be a problem. What happens is, is as we become aware of somebody, we can say, hey, make sure they're on your list. Mm -hmm. So like, you can have Laurel, like a Laurel that's not in that region that can make sure that they're on the list and sort of kind of contacts about it. And a lot of times we do have laurels from outside of that region coming and saying, hey, do you know about this person? They're doing this amazing work. And then we go, oh, really? And then what you'll probably find is even if you don't play in those regions, those laurels might start asking questions <laughs> and trying to see what it is, what work it is you're doing. We certainly have worked that out in Ontier where the, it happens in both ways and we try to be aware of it. Um, I would say there's even more awareness every year um, but the first time I recall that happening was actually about 10 years ago, um, which was somebody who was from Western and going up to Thierry and doing lots of stuff in, or Avacal, doing lots of things in Avacal. And so Avacal came and said, are you aware of this person? Do you know what an amazing person they, they are? Um, they, she does this amazing tent stuff and astro astronomy work and, you know, she does all this stuff here. And so once we became aware of it, then we were able to really kind of pay attention to her and keep talking about her and get her through. Even though she, if it was she, uh, she yeah. um, didn't participate in her area? Right, right. Uh, because she participated everywhere else, right? So it's, it's um, and that's, I think, one of the unique burdens to a kingdom like here that's so geographically spread. Um, it used to be a really big deal like 15 years ago, how well known are they throughout the kingdom? And then we started going, yeah, but our kingdom is really freaking huge, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, they come from Canada, right, their right, work right. Is, is stellar. Exactly, right. exactly. And that's actually a conversation we're having more. Um, yeah. The king recently he was like, look, uh, even places our far reaches really we still far have off, trouble. inlands way up in Alberta, way down in south, almost western. We need to support those people. And the council is becoming really aware of this. And we're trying, to, we're doing things like this. I went over to the Inlands and had this huge five hour Q&A about the Laurel process and I brought some names back. And we're trying to reach out and have that. And for the people who are in far off regions, what you can do is foster those relationships with those Laurels you can find and you're having a good conversation with. And every year it's easier and more and more is being done oddly in the SCA with online stuff. So those people who are in far reaches or doing things outside, they're doing more things like blogs and we can look at their blog work and they can be in dialogues that are more like worldwide conversations about flax or you know, hemp or something. And so they can have these huge conversations and we're like, yeah, we know this person from this. And so there's ways, it becomes easier. So I would say in years past sometimes it could be hard. If you're in a region and not playing in it and playing someplace else, those barriers can be difficult. That's again a good reason to have an advocate, somebody who can speak to speak for you, either from anywhere, who can represent you. But also having um, more and more of an awareness in the kingdom. That's an active conversation happening in our peerage council about how to you bridge those far off areas where there's not enough laurel representation, and also accepting laurels from other regions to be their representative and advocate and ways to bring on the online conversation. And so those are things we're actively addressing. Okay. Another question? Um, so you've talked about, um, you know, uh, a person is doing their thing and they're kind of off there and then laurels are kind of lurking around at the edges and um, observing people and then noticing them 
yes. and then going back and then talking about them, and then yes. in their discussions, maybe moving them up from freshman to sophomore to junior to senior and everything like that. Um, and I understand that if a person was to uh, have an apprentice relationship with the Laurel, that there would be a lot of communication, you know, with them, you know, in terms of, oh, hey, we were just talking about moving you up to junior. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But I would assume that at least in that kind of a relationship, there is. If a person does not have a um, formal, you know, apprentice relationship with any kind of Laurel, but, you know, you've talked about that person and, and are excited about that person and are, you know, you're moving them up amongst your ranks and everything. Is there any kind of communication with that person or is that just something that just kind of happens in the background unbeknownst to that? We're sneaking. Yeah. yeah. It's the yeah. sneaky yeah. conversation. We'll, yeah. we'll get the information to you. Yeah. You won't know it's us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, we, we try to foster those um, channels with their friends, with their associates. We, we try to get something. And it, it's also not always best, by the way, just to clarify, with apprentices to be that upfront about exactly yeah. where they are yeah. on the list yeah. because it adds a lot of stress to somebody. Yeah. I mean, you might say, you're doing really good. I want to be able to, to, to evolve this discussion. But actually, the further up the list they get, usually the less information they get from you. <laughs> because the more stressful it is already, just because you start to feel like you're in a fishbowl when you're in those last two or three years because you have weird laurels that you've never met coming up and right. asking you strange questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you have okay, people looking at and yeah. going, why, hello, how oh, are you? Yeah. you know? you're Your like, seams are beautiful. Who the hell are you? <laughs> you know? And so it gets really stressful for everybody involved. So we, we do, we're, we're more or less successful at being, trying to help guide people even if they're not formal apprentices about, hey, we'd love to see, what's your research you're using? How'd you make this decision? We try to be better. Um, there are some epic fails, but that's the theory, is that we right. try to be We're sneaky and clever. Are there, uh, you know, is there um, almost always a situation where any Laurel has always been an apprentice to someone, or are there situations where no, no one's ever been an apprentice to anyone, yeah. but, that's you know... Like and still make it? And still... Oh, make yeah. It. yeah. All the time. Yeah. Okay. We have a lot of Laurels who haven't gone through that formal process and don't don't feel as comfortable or didn't create that relationship. We, they're still on our radar. We're still trying to have that communication. Uh, could you tell me the time? Yes. Uh, it's only 10 after 12. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. I think that there's a lot of... I'll warn um, you. I, I think it's more about having a mentor and somebody you can admire. Mm -hmm. Whether it's that you want to learn a skill from somebody or whether you think that they're just this great example of what you'd like to see be like. Like when I grew up in the UCA, I want to be like this person. You know, sometimes, and that doesn't always have to be informal. It can be somebody that's in your household. It could be somebody that you decide to just camp with or that you interact with when you can. Sometimes it can be just So as I'd like to, to drill into that a little bit. What kind of feedback do you give your apprentice? What, what, you know, at the beginning, near the middle, near the end, what does that look like when you're having that conversation? It all depends on the apprentice themselves. Like I was saying with Shadra, um, she'd been in this game for quite a while and she'd been serious with her arts and sciences for quite a while as well. So she's, she already was up to that level, really. And my part in it, instead of holding her hand the whole time, because she didn't need anyone like that, it was just to sometimes uh, sort of be a teacher in the mentor sense of if there are personality problems with someone else, be that middle man person for her. Or documentation, which is one of my strengths of, as well. You'd be surprised at some people you think they must do really good with documentation when they're, especially when they're entering kingdom. And it's sometimes amazingly bad. And so I hope that's my strength in, in that department. So Chandra needed more help with the documentation and how to organize that stuff and, and instead of anything else art-wise. Whereas Javasina, she's the person I need to hold hand more, you know. And so I would encourage her to start a project she's interested in in time to sh not necessarily enter a contest because sometimes, especially for a beginner, that's very scary. So if there's going to be an ANS display at some event, especially if it's local, you know, it depends on <laughs> if this person is able to travel or not so much. So if it, I try to encourage her to make something to be displayed at something that does, at an event that's not going to overwhelm her, but to get that foot through the into the water sort of thing. And then just gradually, 
you know, sort of spread it more, give her more. Well, that's that's my style, and and I, I'm not the kind that demands of you to be my servant, you know. <laughs> but if that is what I mean, uh, that's the other thing. Jamesina herself was wanting to be is to learn how to be on retinue, and I've been in so many of them. So so that's when I would give her that opportunity to help me set up and load and unload and all that sort of thing. But that is not a requirement for me if you're going to be my apprentice to be that person. You know? I, I think that's going to jump into the topic, but before we do, I saw your hand up earlier and I wanted to give you an opportunity. What do you do when you had a dead end? You find yourself just, <laughs> you know, there, there's more out there, but advancing, learning more, improving, and you just find yourself stuck. In spring. As an artist? Or as a, or with a student? I mean, personally, in your particular area, as a laurel now, I would assume you could go to other laurels and ask questions, but you don't necessarily oh. have that person. Yeah, you rest what, on your do laurels. You <laughs> right, how do we keep going? That's a really good question. I find my inspiration comes with my students. So I'm kind of like, yeah, I know this, but it's when they start asking me questions, then I go to the computer and I start researching or I start collecting books that I know are going to help things. One of my greatest joys is every 12th night, the, the only gifts I ever give my students are books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's all about finding the book, the next book that I think is going to help them in the research, especially because a lot of them are uh, starving students or people who just don't have enough. They, don't, they have a very, so the idea of buying, because I hit upon the best thing in the whole wide world is like, I don't need to keep any paperbacks, any fiction books. The only books I want to keep are research books. <laughs> and I found, you know what? I can buy used research books for five bucks on Amazon. <laughs> and so it's great. So I buy books and I, that's really what inspires me because I'll find a student, including my children who are now bards too, and they'll be like, hey, I need help finding this. And I'll start finding, I'm like, here. <laughs> and that just gets really exciting for me too. And then I get really involved and then I have to be like, okay, here. <laughs> and I, <laughs> But it, sometimes it helped me find a new interest and a new passion, mm -hmm. a thing that I want to do as well. Yeah, as you know on what you just said. I mean, just uh, sometimes the teacher also is a student, you know, and, yeah. it, it, and it, that makes me then, if I do the research as well, a better teacher, you know, so. I, I went, so I have a friend, one of my apprentices, and she sings in crazy millions di of different languages, and she uh, wants to do this cow calling thing, right? In, it's a Swedish sort of yodeling thing. And so to do that, I'm like, holy cow, well, you need somebody to answer. So I'm like, I'll learn it too. So I'm sitting here <laughs> learning this Swedish yodeling. And I even went to Sweden. And in Sweden, I tracked down through like six different people until I could get a yodeler who could teach me how to yodel so that I could come and yodel in the competition with her so she can do her thingy and I can yodel back. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, really fun. So it's mostly That's students, great. I think, that cause me to get into trouble and learn new things when I get bored. <laughs> so, yeah. And I guess I'm in a unique position. I don't have a student yet. Um, I've been a Laurel for two years now. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm a performer. Um, and we, I guess we sort of have it easy uh, in that way because there is such a passion in the moment of doing that craft. Um, whereas with textile, with other crafts, there's a lot of like, you're sitting there and you're doing this one thing over and over again for eight hours. And so I can't speak quite as much to the passion of that project. You do that, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I would love to hear about that. But that next moment of engaging an audience and being participating in that really drives the want to create more of that stuff. And it's my passion to be doing this age. And I feel that presenting without having that research, without having that understanding of that medieval evil world, for me at least, is where I draw that inspiration. Not, not everyone has that, not every path. You know, the laurel is not, everyone must eventually become a laurel. It's not something you have to do. It's something you really need to be passionate about. Um, and I think one of those things for performers is that passion of that time period. Does that mean you need a master's thesis? No but it does mean that you have a passion and an understanding and a look at that world. And I, I'd love mm -hmm. to hear, wh where's your passion for someone who sits down? I can't, like, I like can't comprehend 32 hours and like, spinning. I feel so good with my bleeding hands and broken neck. <laughs> You're crazy. I'm, I'm a Libra, I can do both. I've done both. I'm a, I've been yeah. a, I think I first 
got noticed by the laurels because of my singing, really, more mm. than actually. I got better with my knitting afterwards. You know, I, I had just learned how to do this mid, the Middle Eastern knitting thing at KWAS when it was here, we now I'm here. So that's when I got even more serious with the knitting and I had started also doing the dye stuff, all this textile stuff, only like after, pre, just pre, not or after. So mainly it was the, it was the, singing. the singing. However, at the same time it was, the passion was about I know our people's music is great, but so many people have not heard it because, like I said, we're practically Aztecs. You know, something people learn about ex extinct people. tribes or something. But we had we had contrib contributed so much during the medieval period, especially to other European monarchs. So every time I, that's why I was being known more not just as a singer, but as a singer of foreign songs. So. So that it's not just me learning my stuff, you know, my culture's music, but also for, to give the opportunity for others to hear, this is what we create, you know, and this is what we created in a medieval time, and some of it now, because our liturgy is based on medieval stuff, you know, so it had maintained that old way of writing or singing the songs. So when I was doing Bardic, that was the, but once I got hooked on knitting and stuff, I could, oh, I have to do this and for eight hours because the end result, it's a bad process for me, but it's also the end result is trying to come up with really the best thing. version of something and say, look, this is what we do also in the Middle yeah. Ages. You yeah. know, these are the songs we sing and these are the things we did. I think know? all the laurels I know, their interests meander far after they become a, a laurel. <laughs> so they might have been done for this yeah. because it's really not. Ultimately, what it comes down to, it's not always about your expertise in a craft. It's about your passion for research and sharing that research with other people. And I think that that's the common thread that, that ties a lot of laurels together. Maybe not all of them. Yeah, we're all geeks. We're all geeks. That's what ties us together. So I, I want to jump into um, a myth that's a little more sensitive. Um, when you're talking about a laurel apprentice or a laurel student relationship, you're talking about a large power dynamic. Um, and with all large power dynamics, there can be abuse. And I wanted to, to just sort of dispel some myths about servitude and, you know, being someone's, you know, mm -hmm. sort of slave for the entire camping experience and how different laurels approach that and how we need to consent to that and have yeah. that kind of conversation. I actually have in my contract and only if the person chooses that. Because if that's what they want to learn, because they might even have plans to become retinue people. Ha again, like I said, I had experience being on retinue, both baronial and kingdom, so I could pass that. So that's what they need from me, and that's what I will give them. But I do will not require that at all, because it's not the, that's not the point of our relationship. The point of our relationship is to it's sort of a mutual thing. I learn something from you, you learn something from me, but also I'm helping you, I'm guiding you. I'm, I'm not someone who should be abusing this relationship by saying, go get me some water, you know, or... or Catch me breakfast. Yeah. Right. You know, peel my grapes, woman. You know? Put up my entire cap. So, so it's only, just like it is now with my apprentice, only if that person wishes it, requires it in their relationship because they want to specifically learn about serving on retinue, do I then give the them that opportunity to get me water or something? <laughs> but I always say please and I'll thank you too. That's my style. Yeah. I mean, I, I originally, I don't really even do contracts particularly. They're all verbal, ad hoc, improvisational contracts at the, in the moment. Um, but no people agree. And it's fine. And we don't usually do those kind of things. So it's all about learning and sharing and exchanging information for the most part. Yeah, we don't want power, both me and her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not what it's about. Yeah, it's not about that. But for some people, it is. And, and which is why it's really important. Uh, so if you're approached, or if you approach someone else, mm -hmm. you really need to have an exacting conversation. Mm -hmm. You're not going to necessarily come out with a contract that that's cool, but you should know what they're expecting yeah. of you, you're expecting of them, and what you're consenting yeah. to do. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's good to bake in a check-in time. Like, And we'll check in three months and make sure this is working. And then we'll check once a year and make sure that it's 
uh, it's still to both of our tastes. Not that it's a good idea. A lot of times, if you have too. geographical, like you're down here in Oregon and your role is way up in Canada, emails can be a very good tool to use yeah. to update, hey, what project are you working Facebook on? Or how's your project going? And then you coordinate meeting at some event, which, uh, which is what I did with uh, Chandra actually a lot of times. And we would take a specific time during 12th night or whatever event we're gonna be together in to actually update or see that work or any problems that may be happening, you know, so that at least if it if we're so far away geographically we can still maintain a, that kind of relationship you know if it works and it worked with Shadra only because she didn't need me to hold her hand the whole time she knew what she was doing if you have um, a uh, uh, an apprentice um, have you ever first of all have you ever had other uh, apprentices that have wanted to um, you know um, not necessarily have formal relationships with other laurels, but certainly have, you know, learn as much as they can from other laurels. And do you, A, encourage that? And if someone wanted to do that, would you say, you know, would you encourage them not to be your apprentice if they wanted to have a relationship with a new, numerous laurels? It, it depends on the goal, right? It depends on the person. So if they're shopping around looking for the right laurel, I might not be the right laurel for them. But if they have an existing relationship with me, I really see myself as a relationship broker. I spend most of my time getting my apprentices in contact with all the other people who do the thing that they do or who have something to add to them. And, and mostly it's all about connecting people. So that's actually something I encourage strongly. Um, I probably would want to have a conversation, I generally want to have a conversation with any student who wants to go and take formal learning from somebody to understand the parameters of that and how that impacts our relationship. So I probably talk about it, but I definitely have them work with other people all the time. Ditto again. <laughs> yeah, because um, we're not, we don't, uh, no matter how fantastic we are, we don't know everything about everything, but we do know who does know about <laughs> stone, <Right. laughs> stone carving. So I would be sending people to Garan for Armenian music, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> or dance, right. Right. right? I feel like you totally But like you were saying, if you have this formal thing, yeah. and that you still have to have that agreement, say, yeah. you know, Go ahead, you, it, that's my job is to help you learn stuff. Yep. If that person over there is the one who's gonna be able to help you, but remember that we ha you're mine, basically. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and laurels share people all the time. Yeah. There's people who are like, oh, she's mine and so-and-so's, you know. Yeah, there have been dual laurel right. relationships or yeah. passing one off to the yeah. other uh, as a laurel moves out of the society or mm -hmm. life Very happens. You know, we, we look after our own. Mm -hmm. Like if someone dies, if someone- Grad school. Grad school happens. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. Uh, other questions? No, no, no. Okay, awesome. So, uh, back to the Laurel process. Uh, we've covered the meetings. Uh, we've covered uh, getting out of the meetings. The v variety of of you know uh, geographic locations and how we have that communication and the Laurel apprentice process. Um, is there something else you guys want to speak to? I just sort of want to give, give the floor to you guys. Is there something about the process that you've heard a myth about that you would like to dispel? Well, um, mostly I kind of speak, spoke to it earlier, which is if you're doing an art and a craft, it, you know, an art or a science, people, the girls are most excited by people who want to share their knowledge and their information and their skills. So feel free to do that with people. If you're doing something and you're hiding it and you don't, so for example, you like to do an art and you want people to notice it, maybe do it for largesse, right? Mm -hmm. Or something that could add to court or something like that. That's a good way for people to see what it is you're doing. Talk about your craft. Have an interest and a curiosity in understanding the context of where it came from. Um, at least if you're interested in having laurels being att paying attention to what it is you're doing, having in an interest in the context, asking questions and not being afraid. Most laurels, all you need to do is say, so what is it that you do? 
and you poke them, and they'll be like, la, 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 la. <laughs> and then, and ah, then you'll up. get to hear, and you'll get to hear lots about what it is they're interested in, and then you, and they might go, so what is it you do? And then that's your opportunity to sort of geek out. And that, to me, is one of the best things about mm-hmm. having roles for friends, is I do some pretty obscure things. And what, I, I, some people hate competition. I love competitions because it's the one time that I know somebody's taking a considerable effort to get judges in front who might have at least a passing interest in Nickel Harpa, right? <laughs> and I can be, a, this is a Nickel Harpa, this is what would be like a period, and this is a ah, and I can talk all about the thing I've done, right? That I've spent six months of my life or two years of my life looking at this really obscure information and pulling out drawings and art and samples and sound and extrapolating and taking all this information and I can talk about it to people who actually care. I try to do this to my family and their eyes glaze over, (laughs) right? And they're like, right, and this is what? Why do you do this? And so it's really fun if you have these sort of obscure interests to learn everything you can about it and these are people who will actually listen to you. I can't tell you how many times I've listened to Eleanor talk about shoulder cuts, and I'm like, wow, really? You know, and all the different ways that her bleos go together. And it's like, we actually care, and we like to listen to these things, whereas so many other people look at you like you're just a lunatic. So I encourage you that if you like to research things, talk to Laurel. Do you have an announcement? Yes, I do. And on my favorite indulgence, an insulin packet was found in Willamette West right after the Knights and Pels meeting. Anybody? owns it or knows who it belongs to, it is being held down at gate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, I would I only add that, uh, well, speaking of myths, is just um, the thing that we're not approachable, that is false. Most of us, at least, are approachable. Except for, and, and Except for that one guy. If you want to, uh, you know, have que- you have questions for us, when, just, just come to us. You know, don't be afraid of us, because we, well, I was going to say we were one of you, but I don't mean it that way. You know, it's just, we're, all we're human, you know. We're all artists. We're yeah, all and we like we love to share this stuff. We love to meet yet another person who's interested in knitting. You know, I know. That reminded me, Garan, that the other thing is, is you have to realize is these are all geeks, right? Yeah. People who are geeky, studying obscure things, not always the best social skills. <laughs> right? So laurels in general <laughs> are not always approachable and outgoing. Some of them are really shy and kind of grunky, <laughs> you know, because they're just into their thing. So be aware that you're talking to people who kind of, they study obscure things and not all of them are approachable, not because they're mean, it's just because they're, they, they don't have, we're still all part of the SCA, we still don't always have the best social skills. And if you know what the, their thing is, and you approach them with questions about that thing, they suddenly will just, yeah. <laughs> they the will become ever. approachable then, you know. Yeah. Awesome. So what is the biggest barrier for you as an audience? to have more engagement with the laurels is who are the laurels who not are knowing, the laurels not knowing you know if you're someone that is reasonably new and you yeah. uh, you know haven't met very many laurels then how do you pick them up right so um because <laughs> we all grab for our dangles other, other than, <laughs> other than no, looking at our dangles yeah. so um, that's a but, great. But here's here's a good one. Pretty you know, obvious today. Three laurels, three different forms. <laughs> right. Yeah, they all so look all the same. You know, oh, I I, I yeah, didn't yeah. realize that yeah. was all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre- as well. You know, pre- you know the laurel leaves, right? Yeah. Obviously. So above and beyond that, say you're into a thing and you want to contact your laurel, local laurels, see see who they are and start like sniffing at them and, and finding out. Go to to your local bureaucracy. Go to your baron and baroness. Say, hey, I'm sort of mm-hmm. interested in thing. Who are our local laurels and what do they do? And they can they can spout that list. Um, there is a list of just names on the SCA wiki. If you if you look up onto your SCA wiki, you can find those names. And like bards, there's a category for bards, and then you'll right. See and you can. Mm, oh, I it. I think it's it's starting to get categorized. Um, <laughs> it's getting there. A lot but, of it's that introduction, right? Yeah, getting that Find one person and then say, well, what I'm really interested in this. And then they're, part of their job is to help introduce you to the people who do those things that you do. Right. Yeah, go to your center shop, go to your... And then sometimes they have these, if not A&S displays, they have this meet a laurel kind of yeah, display, we're, Fred kind of thing. Fred tees. There, we're doing the Freds, we're the doing the tees. tees. There's speed laurel dating, which is hilarious and wonderful. <laughs> You yeah, have like a times. two minutes to sit down and, and talk to, one. And talk to a laurel, the laurel and then you get like 13 laurels. No, so you great. get to hear, like you get to rotate to all these different laurels yeah, to find out what they're wanting. That's a good way to meet them. Uh, 
we're, we're hoping where do you to have those kinds of well, They had one last year at Twelfth Night. Yeah, and they it didn't get together this year. Yeah. Um, maybe. Was another one, Kingdom Hearts was around town? Yeah, maybe. It's a really stuffed That's event, really but hard. maybe okay, the, it, might, it might show up there. Uh, it's going to be at one of the indoor events, so it's going to be Twelfth Night or um, July Coronation. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make everybody more approachable. We're trying to get right. out more. Other barriers? Um, one of the things from where I am, we have very few, because we're from, I'm from Southern Summits. <gasps> we're so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there are great people there, just yes. not a lot of them. And, <laughs> of, well, about three years ago, I asked who the Laurels were, got introduced to, and was speaking at different events with each of them. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they found out that I was interested in fiber arts, that's where my passion was, it was, Oh well, I really don't do that, and the conversation died. And you, if you don't mind, you're a great example of, of, of an area that we know that we're underserving, that there's yeah. not enough people mm -hmm. there. Um, what kind of fiber arts do you like to do? I do Watch everything: spinning, <laughs> dyeing, yep. weaving. What? I actually do from sheep to shawl. Sheep to shawl. Who's our best sheep to shawl? Oh, that, so so. Modern. Modern. Would be awesome. Okay. I was going to say the last thing that I'm working on to get better at is my dyeing yeah. because I've got everything, including I couldn't find anybody to teach me null binding, so, so if, I went on YouTube. So this would be a great place where online stuff can help. And mm -hmm. if you wanted to give me your email address, mm -hmm. I could make some connections with you and some other fiber arts people in other areas of the kingdom. I would appreciate that. Yes. So to expand on that. What we're seeing here is someone really <laughs> far off with people who don't have your area of expertise. In your immediate area. In your immediate area. And what you're going to do is start fostering relationships with people outside of your area. And it's going to be through Skype. It's going to be through email. It's going to be through Facebook. And as you use that to foster that relationship, that's how you're going to get more knowledge, obviously, mm -hmm. from that person as you have those conversations. And, and that Maybe. exposure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yay, look at that. Yeah, so give me your That's why we have this. Yeah, we'll do that <laughs> this. For, for you. This are are there other you. people who are f are in areas that they feel they're underserved by the Laurel? We would glad to make a connection for you. You're all around. I mean, I'm in Block the North. I'm oh, in the okay. Central. Every, yeah, okay. Around, uh, whatever. Like, <laughs> right. They're they're off here. They're off there. So you never see them. Oh. Um, you know, I was thinking another way you could figure out is if you go to Kingdom A and S. Uh, Often the judges are the ones who are experts at the judges. that discipline. So that way you could sort of look at them and say, who is judging this? No, you know, when you see a bunch of laurels them. who are judging the dyes or whatever, you go, okay, then these are the people I need to right. meet. And it could even be baronial, because some people, when they do baronial championship, will call for laurels from other places. So be a little more observant. That's one of the other options you can have is, is when, you come to these sort of events and sort so of... So remind me again, what, what kind of things do you do? Um, primarily woodworking right now. I, I also do most of my own sewing. Yeah, yeah. I leave the embellishing with my lady, though. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, lately, mostly skiing by me. Were you in Glamour? Yeah. He's, yeah. Oh, okay. I was down there for a while. That sounded something. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, I'm Alan Kaid. Yeah, it would be fun to get... We can connect you with people. Uh, the main woodworker, oh, I know. Master Rog is, I've gone and spoken with him yep. before. I know Gordon, Gordon is in the general area, but another one I've There's also Sven down in, Sven down in um, Portland. Okay. And then there's Cornelius, but he doesn't really play much these days. Do you do small like things or like furniture? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I do little things like that. I've got a bent wood box in the auction. I, I make canopy beds. So you also would be sending me, I'd be happy to connect you with people. So give me your name and... With that, any final questions before we end this thing? You, you asked about myths and things. And yeah. So here's a long one that I've heard in several kingdoms. Do it. So I was taught, I was fighting Master you know, Ferenc at practice a few months back, and I hit him really hard. I think I pissed him off. I'll never be a Laurel man. Oh, oh three-year rule. Great. Three-year rule. Yeah. Let's talk about that. We totally. We have a three-year rule in our council. So, or really, it's a two. It's a two or three-year rule, which is if somebody goes and says, "Oh, but he did blah 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 and blah 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 blah," we're like, 
When was that? 1995, we're done. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, that happened three years ago, yeah. right? And so we really try to say, so we at least have those issues. And we do start to know, sometimes there's just people who have there's just personality apprenticeships that went bad. You know, this person's never going to be ready. And, and we sort of question that a lot. And we really poke at that in our region a lot, going, well, that person's opinion aside, what does other people think? And sometimes <laughs> well, the strategies we have, like let's say for a long time we had, for example, this was years and years ago, we only really had one scribal role. And that scribal role had a death hold on anybody who did scribal arts in our region. And so what we did, because there was somebody there that didn't get along with that person who was an excellent scribe, so we got scribes from other regions to come and talk about our person. And that was enough to be like, that, that we had more voices to speak, to advocate for that person than the one person. So that we have ways, we have strategies for dealing mm -hmm. with that kind of thing. Time limits on people whining about bad behavior and- um, As long as you've improved. Right, I mean, right yeah. of course, as long if as you that are behavior still is not- yeah. Drunk and picking fights with Laurel's fisticuffs in the field, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not gonna make it. <laughs> right, so yes, assuming that that was something that is long in your past, we have yeah. ways of dealing with it. Because some of us started as teenagers in the SCA, or early 20s or something. There are people with long, long histories of my husband at 15 <laughs> in the SCA. <laughs> took a long time, yeah. yeah. Um, I think with that, I'm gonna close it. Uh, Thank yeah. you very much. Sure. Thank you Thank very much, you. audience, you. for doing this and Thank participating. You give me your card or come and put yeah, your name in Yeah, you guys are. I'm going to turn off the video. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Literally. Cool. All right, I'll see what I can do about connecting you with some people. Is there an actual room on here? Why don't you give me both? Casey, Jillian, could you help me pack up?